Thanks, guys. Tim, alcoholic. For those of you following along, we're on page 96 at the top. <clears throat> this is the second half of the 12th step, working with others. <clears throat> Do not be discouraged if your prospect does not respond at once. Search out another alcoholic and try again. You are sure to find someone desperate enough. That's a key ingredient, right? What are we looking for? Hopelessness. Hopelessness opens the channel. You are sure to find someone desperate enough to accept with eagerness what you offer. We find it a waste of time to keep chasing a man who cannot or will not work with you. If you leave such a person alone, he may soon become convinced he cannot recover by himself. If he's a real alcoholic, he is beyond human aid. If that be the case, then self-will, his own determination, no matter how strong it is, will not work. That's our definition. To spend too much time on any one situation is to deny some other alcoholic an opportunity to live and be happy. One of our fellowship, Bill Wilson, failed entirely with his first half dozen prospects. It's been discussed why did Bill fail with a, uh, his first half dozen prospects prior to Dr. Bob when he had all the same information before going to Akron. Well, one was Dr. Silkworth made the suggestion not to lead with the white light experience that it scared the crap out of people, right? To lead with the medical determination of the gig, twofold disease. Again, it can be discussed as a twofold disease or a threefold disease, mental, physical, spiritual malady. Um, uh, so that was one. That was a change of perspective, not to lead with the white light experience. Number two, Bill is pacing the Mayflower Hotel afraid he's gonna drink. And he says, I have to reach out to another alcoholic for me to stay sober. Prior to that, Bill was trying to save other alcoholics. Different perspective. Success rate goes way down when you think you're going to that person to save them. It goes way up when you say, I'm not in the results game. I'm in the effort game. And for me to stay sober, I have to do step 12, the first part of step 12. He often says that if he had continued to work with them, he might have deprived many others who have since recovered of their chance. Recovered from what? A seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. <coughs> Suppose now you are making your second visit to a man. He has read this volume. Yeah, right and says he is prepared to go through with the 12 steps of the program of recovery. Having had the experience yourself, why? Because you can't transmit what you don't have, right? Having had the experience yourself, you can give him much practical advice. Let him know you are available if he wishes to make a decision. What is that? That's step three. That's the surrender. If he wishes to make a decision and tell his story, so that would be four and five, right? But do not insist upon it if he prefers to consult someone else. He may be broke and homeless. If he is, you might try to help him about getting a job or give him a little financial assistance but you should not deprive your family or creditors of money they should have. Perhaps you will want to take the man into your home for a few days, but be sure you use discretion. Be certain he will be welcomed by your family and that he is not trying to impose upon you for money, connections, or shelter. What was Bill's success rate of all the guys that he had living in 182 Clinton? Zero. Permit that and you only harm him. You will be making it possible for him to be insincere. You may be aiding in his destruction rather than his recovery. 
Never avoid these responsibilities, but be sure you are doing the right thing if you assume them. Helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery, not theirs, your recovery. A kindly act once in a while isn't enough. You have to act the Good Samaritan every day if need be. It may mean the loss of many nights sleep, great interference with your pleasures, interruptions to your business. It may mean sharing your money and your home, counseling frantic wives and relatives, innumerable trips to police courts, sanitariums, hospitals, jails, and asylums. Your telephone may jangle at any time of, day, of the day or night. Your wife may sometimes say she is neglected. A drunk may smash the furniture in your home or burn a mattress. You may have to fight with him if he is violent. Sometimes you will have to call a doctor and administer sedatives under his dis direction. Another time you may have to send for the police or an ambulance. Occasionally, you will have to meet such conditions. D didn't uh, uh, Bill have the ultimate thing happen in his house? He goes down to vi he goes down to visit Fitz Mayo. Him and Lois, uh, uh, our southern friend, as we could read a story in here. He goes down to visit him, and while he's gone, Bill Campbell, who's a uh, 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 Canadian-born former attorney, pro gambler, played bridge for money. And he was actually, turns out, he was stealing Bill and Lois's better clothing and hawking it. He committed suicide in their house while, he's, while they're gone. He put, took the pilot light, put it out, turned the gas on, stuck his head in the stove. So these are the sorts of bi things that Bill were putting himself out for. And then I heard a great thing. A guy got sandbagged in a Saturday morning uh, meeting, and he came up from Baltimore. And he said something to the effect of, if you're not being inconvenienced by AA, maybe you're not in AA. And to me, that means I just don't go to meetings for the sake of going to meetings. I go to meetings to meet a new person to help them. It's a completely different perspective. We seldom allow an alcoholic to live in our homes for a long time. It is not good for him, and it sometimes creates serious complications in a family. Though an alcoholic does not respond, there is no reason why you should neglect his family. You should continue to be friendly to them. The family should be offered your way of life. Now, of course, this is written in 39, pre-Al-Anon, Al-Anon 1953. Lois is a co-founder, as is Ann Bingham. Ann Bingham and Lois Wilson are the co-founders, but it's making the point that Al-Anon is using the same steps with the exception of the word alcohol isn't in step one. It's alcoholic. You are powerless over the alcoholic. So it's making the point here, the family should be offered your way of life. That's what you'd recommend to the family now since we have Al-Anon, right? You guys are in pain. Your, your, your spouse is not stopping drinking. That's okay. That's their gig. Your gig is you can go do this someplace else. Right? You have your own work to do. Should they accept and practice spiritual principles, there is a, a much better chance that the head of the family will recover. And even though he continues to drink, this is important, life can't be circumstantial. Our happiness can't be based on circumstance. Watch. And even though he continues to drink, the family will find life more bearable. For the type of alcoholic who is able and willing to get well, little charity in the ordinary sense of the word is needed or wanted. The men who cry for money and shelter before conquering alcohol are on the wrong track. Yet, we do go to great extremes to provide each other with these very things when such action is warranted. This may seem inconsistent, but we think it is not. To me, that means it's an art. <laughs> run, run your plan by a couple of people. <laughs> right? It is not the matter of giving that is in question, but when and how to give. That often makes the difference between failure and success. The minute we put our work on a service plane, just so normally we talk about service in a very positive sense, like I do service, I do service. Here it's used, being used as a less than. Watch. 
the minute we put our work on a service plane, meaning just giving the person a, a hookup on a job, money, I'll come pick you up, it, it's this sort of lower level gig. The alcoholic commences to, re, to rely upon our assistance rather than upon God. He clamors for this or that claiming he cannot master alcohol until his material needs are cared for. Nonsense. Some of us have taken very hard knocks to learn this truth. Job or no job, wife or no wife, we simply do not stop drinking so long as we place dependence upon other people ahead of dependence on God. Burn the idea into the consciousness of every man that he can get well regardless of anyone. The only condition is that he trust in God and clean house. Does it say have faith in God? No, that's implied. That's, faith is in 1, 2, and 3. Trust is when you get active, 4 through 12. And you do 4 through 11 so that you can get unblocked to do good 12. Everything's about 12. <clears throat> so it doesn't say believe in God. We're past that. We, yeah, yeah, I know you believe in God. But do you depend on God? Do you trust on, in God? And the cleaning house is to keep unblocked. 4 through 11. Now the domestic problem. There may be divorce, separation, or just strained relations. When your prospect has made such reparation as he can to his family, meaning amends, right? and he has thoroughly explained to them the new principles by which he is living, he should proceed to put those principles into action at home. So we see that in 12, right? That's the second part of 12. And to practice these principles in all our affairs. But that is trumped by one alcoholic to another, right? The 12 is primary you passing the message to try to pass this message to another alcoholic secondary is to practice these principles in all our affairs, right? So often we hear people say, well, I'm not that comfortable taking somebody through the steps. Well, that's okay. You can get away with that for a little while. What's another example of somebody doing one alcoholic to another alcoholic in a different way besides sitting there and working on the steps? What's another way? Take a speaking commitment and do from the podium experience strength and hope. Same thing. It's passing the message. Same thing. Somebody said, oh, I'm not comfortable with sitting down with somebody yet. I only you know, I have eight months. I only went through the steps one. You know, fine. That's cool. Take a speaking commitment. <clears throat> that is, if he is lucky enough to have a home, though his family be at fault in many respects, he should not be concerned about that. You don't worry about the other person. You're only worried about your own uh, uh, shortcomings. He should concentrate on his own spiritual demonstration. There again is a verb. It's action. Demonstration. I prove it. I can point to it and say that was a, a, a situation in which I can, I'm showing that I depend on God. I trust in God. It's, it's, it's an actual event you point to. It's not a philosophical conversation. Argument and fault finding are to be avoided like the plague. In many homes, this is a difficult thing to do. But it must be done if any results are to be expected. If persisted in for a few months, the effect on a man's family is sure to be great. The most incompatible people discover that they have a basis upon which they can meet. Little by little, the family may see their own defects and admit them. We don't point them out. The family may see their own defects. These can then be discussed in an atmosphere of helpfulness and friendliness. After they have seen tangible results, the family will perhaps want to go along. These things will come to pass naturally and, good, and in good time provided, however, the alcoholic continues to demonstrate that he can be sober, considerate, and helpful regardless of what anyone else says or does. So that means staying free of resentments, right? That's exactly what that's saying. Of course, we all fall much below this standard many times, but we must try to repair the damage immediately, 
lest we pay the penalty by a spree. Sounds like step 10 to me, right? Repair immediately. I identify it, oh, I messed up there, and circling back and repairing the damage, amending the behavior, apologizing, any one of those or all. Dep what depends on what this situation calls for. If there be divorce or separation, there should be no undue haste for the couple to get together. The man should be sure of his recovery. The wife should fully understand his new way of life. If their old relationship is to be resumed, it must be on a better basis, since the former did not work. This means a new attitude and spirit all around. Sometimes it is to the best interests of all concerned that a couple remain apart. Obviously, no rule can be laid down. Let the alcoholic continue his program day by day. When the time for living together has come, it will be apparent to both parties. Sounds a little bit like step nine in the promises. We will intuitively know. Right? You, the answer will come to you in your gut. It will be a belly barometer. Let no alcoholic say he cannot recover unless he has his family back. This just isn't so. In some cases, the wife will never come back for one reason or another. Remind the prospect that his recovery is not dependent upon people. No circumstance is a good excuse. It is dependent upon his relationship with God. We have seen men get well whose families have not returned at all. We have seen others slip when the family came back too soon. Both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. Here's the 12-step promises. Watch them. If you persist, Remarkable things will happen. When we look back, we realize that the things which came to us when we put ourselves in God's hands were better than anything we could have planned. Follow the dictates of a higher power and you will presently live in a new and wonderful world no matter what your present circumstances! Exclamation point. Even if you've not gotten your driver's license back, even if you did not get the job, even if the divorce is still going through, you can have a beautiful life. It's a perspective change. We're doing psychic change. We're doing a 180, looking at life through different glasses. Uh, in, psycho in one form of psychology, they call transcendence. When working with a man and his family, you should not care to, excuse me, you should, you should take care not to participate in their quarrels. You may spoil your chance of being helpful if you do, but urge upon a man's family that he, is ver uh, that he has been a very sick person and should be treated accordingly. You should warn against arousing resentment or jealousy. You should point out that his, de his defects of character are not going to disappear overnight. Show them that he has entered upon a period of growth. Ask them to remember, when they are impatient, the blessed fact of his sobriety. If you have been successful in solving your own domestic problems, tell the newcomer's family how that was accomplished. Notice that that was not advice to them, how they should fix their stuff. That was telling them what we did in our experience. In this way, you can set them on the right track without becoming critical of them. The story, how, the story of how you and your wife settled your difficulties is worth any amount of criticism. And there they're using the word criticism to mean advice. Right? Assuming you are spiritually fit, you can do all sorts of things alcoholics are not supposed to do. People have said we must not go where liquor is served. We must not have it in our homes. We must shun friends who drink. We must avoid moving pictures which show drinking scenes. We must not go into bars. Our friends must hide their bottles if we go to their houses. We mustn't think or be reminded about alcohol 
at all. Our experience shows that this is not necessarily so. And where else do we see that in the big book? We have ceased fighting everything and everyone, including alcohol. It's a non-issue. We meet these conditions every day. An alcoholic who cannot meet them still has an alcoholic mind. There is something the matter with their spiritual status. Now, I think that's very sort of cut and dried, and I think there's a lot of gray area that we could discuss on that one. One being, if somebody feels a little shaky, I wouldn't be so overly critical about their spiritual condition. That's where you are right now and accept it. To know that you, it's not right for you to have booze in your house, that's smart. That's good thinking, right? It may change at another time or it may not. I don't think it's that big of a deal. So I don't know if I would grab somebody and, say, and somebody says to me, oh yeah, I don't have booze in my house. And you go, okay, let's turn to page 101. I want to show you that you're not spiritually... I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. His only chance for sobriety would be someplace like the Greenland ice cap. And even there, an Eskimo might turn up with a bottle of scotch and ruin everything. Ask any woman who has sent her husband to distant places on the theory he would escape the alcohol problem. Uh, Bill and Lois are a great example of this. Back in the early 30s, pre him getting sober, what was her great uh, uh, idea? Let's go camping. Right? Every time Bill went camping with Lois, his drinking either went uh, uh, way down to a point where it seemed manageable or it was non-existent. They were out in the woods. He didn't have any booze at some point. Right, So that's where he gets that from personal experience. In our belief, any scheme of combatant, combating alcoholism which proposes to shield the sick man from temptation is doomed to failure. If the alcoholic tries to shield himself, he may succeed for a time, but he usually winds up with a bigger explosion than ever. We have tried these methods. These attempts to do the impossible have always failed. That means 100%, right? Because you, it, it's a different attitude if you go on the wagon, right? That, that would be a term that we would say, we're white knuckling it, like, you know, I'm not going to drink today. That's not what we do. We're looking for a complete transformation where alcohol becomes neutral. Have no opinion on it. Don't care if you're having a glass of wine. I can go to the business. It's all non-issue stuff, right? But we accept the fact that not everybody is there at some point in their sobriety, right? So it's, I don't criticize for that. I'm just saying that that's, we, we're not talking about uh, uh, giving up booze for Lent. It's, it's not what we're doing. We're not what we're doing, right? It's a psychic change. So, our rule is, is not to avoid a place where it, there is drinking. It's italicized now. If we have a legitimate reason for being there, that includes bars, nightclubs, dances, receptions, weddings, even plain, ordinary whoopee parties. To a person who has had experience with an alcoholic, this may seem like tempting providence, capital P, right? But it isn't. You will note that we made an important qualification. So here's, here's the rule. We have to go to, we're going to a business dinner tomorrow, right? We have a bu business dinner tomorrow. Here's what we go. We turn to page 101, bottom of the page. Therefore, ask yourself on each occasion, have I any good social, business, or personal reason for going to this place? And then sit and meditate on that a minute or two. Then go back to the book. Or am I expecting to steal a little vicarious pleasure from the atmosphere of such, a place, some, such places? <clears throat> sit and meditate on that for a couple minutes. If you intuitively say that that's the right place for me to go, I got news for you. It probably is. Right? If you answer these questions satisfactorily, you need have no apprehension. Go or stay away, whichever seems best. But be sure you are on solid spiritual ground before you start and that your motive in going is thoroughly good. Now, this, this in our psychic change, 
we have changed the way we look at how we participate in the world. Here's the proof of it. Do not think of what you will get out of the occasion. Think of what you can bring to it. But if you are shaky, you had better work with another alcoholic instead. I think that's great advice for going to an AA meeting. Do not think of what you will get out of the occasion. Think of what you can bring to it. Why sit with a long face in places where there is drinking, sighing about the good old days? If it is a happy occasion, try to increase the pleasure of those there. If a business occasion, go and attend to your business enthusiastically. If you are, a pers if you are with a person who wants to eat in a bar, by all means, go along. Let your friends know that you are not no, they are not to change their habits on your account. At a proper time and place, explain to all your friends why alcohol disagrees with you. If you do this thoroughly, few people will ask you to drink. While you were drinking, you were withdrawing from life little by little. Now you are getting back into the social life of this world. Don't start to withdraw again just because your friends drink out liquor. What's AA's position on booze? Neutral. None, right. <laughs> we have no opinion on it. Have a blast. That was a guess, by the way. It was a very, very good guess. It was very good. It was intuitive. So you intuitively know. Your job now is to be at the place where you may be of maximum helpfulness to others. So never hesitate to go anywhere if you can be helpful. Your job now is to be at the place where you may be of maximum helpfulness to others. So that means everywhere you go, CVS, everywhere, the gas station, everywhere. You should not hesitate to visit the most sordid spot on earth on such an errand. Keep on the firing line of life with these motives and God will keep you unharmed. Many of us keep liquor in our homes. Who would be uh, two good examples of that? Bill and Bob. Bill and Bob kept booze in the house. Many of us keep liquor in our homes. We often need it to carry green recruits through a severe hangover. Some of us still serve it to our friends, provided they are not alcoholic. So you saw that caveat, right? If you know somebody's an alcoholic and they came to your house, do not serve that person. It said it right there. It just said it. But, some of us think we should not serve liquor to anyone. We never argue this question. We feel that each family, in the light of their own circumstances, ought to decide for themselves. So there's great advice, you know? So if I, I have actually some uncles that are alcoholics, and I might get up and serve a couple of drinks to, you know, to the, to the civilians in the, in the family, but if I know somebody's got a problem with booze, it's just an obvious thing, I'm not getting up and serving the person. I'll let them do their own thing. Right? I'm not serving them, though. Right? That's, like, that's like putting you know, a gasoline on a fire. You know? <laughs> we are careful never to show intolerance or hatred of drinking as an institution. Experience shows that such an attitude is not helpful to anyone. Every new alcoholic looks for this spirit among us and is immensely relieved when he finds we are not witch burners. <clears throat> A spirit of intolerance might repel alcoholics whose lives could have been saved had it not been for such stupidity. We would not even do the cause of temperate drinking any good. That meaning civilian type drinking, normal drinking. For not one drinker in a thousand likes to be told anything about alcohol by one who hates it. Someday, we hope that Alcoholics Anonymous will help the public to a better realization of the gravity of the alcoholic problem. But we shall be of little use if our attitude is one of bitterness or hostility. Drinkers will not stand for it. After all, our problems were of our own making. How is that so? Selfishness, self-centeredness. Selfishness, and self-centeredness. Bottles were only a symbol. Besides, we have stopped fighting anybody 
or anything. We have to. We'll stop there tonight.